So I have a bunch of parts to make today, but more than anything, those parts are going to be an excuse for me to give you guys a tutorial, specifically about making thin parts out of acrylic and polycarbonate. For some reason, acrylic and polycarbonate parts, particularly small, thin ones, have been kind of a staple of my job shop recently, and I've gotten pretty good at making them. So I wanted to share everything that I've learned so that anyone after me can also make similar parts. Those of you who have been following me for a while may know that I like to use super glue work holding on thin parts. It's actually probably my most used fixturing method at this point. It has a lot of advantages, particularly in holding small thin parts, which you just can't do in a vise. And even if you could do it in a vise, the vise would warp the parts. They would cause all kinds of tolerance issues. I have a whole video up about the super glue method and the exact processes that I use. However, those processes fall apart specifically for polycarbonate and acrylic because both of these react to acetone, which you have to use to clean off the super glue when you're done. Plus, many times your customer will want parts out of acrylic because it is optically clear. They may be trying to shine an LED through it or bouncing lasers around or, or who knows what. So there's extra, there's extra considerations because it is clear. First thing you need to know about acrylic specifically is there's two kinds. There is cast acrylic and there is extruded acrylic. This is hardware store acrylic and I believe that stuff is extruded. This is McMaster acrylic and it's still clear, it's just got blue tape on it. But this is cast acrylic. Extruded acrylic comes with a lot more internal stresses and can just generally be more prone to cracking and cause you issues. If you are gonna mill it, you want cast acrylic, not extruded acrylic. McMaster is a great place to buy acrylic, especially if you're making small parts. Something like this is just a few bucks. You can order it on Amazon. And like I said, they do have it at the hardware store if you really need to, but you don't really necessarily know what you're gonna get with those sources. There's also tap plastics and uh, Bodecker plastics if you need it in larger quantities. This is not quite my actual part. I can't show you the real part that I'm gonna be shipping to the customer, but this is a pretty good imitation of it. The customer didn't actually even provide me with a real drawing of the part. It literally is just a CAD model labeled cap. So we'll just assume that everything is plus or minus three thou, which is my shop tolerance, and go from there. So this is, if we measure it, one millimeter thick at its thickest and a little bit thinner even on this section here. So it's 0.83 millimeters there. Uh, they did say there is an allowable corner radius of 15 thou. Uh, in other words, I need to use a 132nd inch end mill to get these corners. So I'm gonna start by going and finding my plate work template which again, I have a different video on this if you wanna see how I come up with these machining templates. But we can copy this. Now we can open up this template file. All I need to do is open up the container, drop in my part. Uh, we'll change the orientation in a second here because I actually want two of these. And then I can remove my container component. We can see my stock. And I'm going to joint these two pieces together, something like 3 eighths of an inch away from each other. So there's lots of room for tools in there. And then I'm going to joint this to my material. And let's make our material a little bit smaller. I think three by three should work. Not quite. Let's try three by four. And now we can go to the cam side. So I'm gonna start by just regenerating everything. I know I'm not gonna do an op zero in this one, so I can delete off that op zero. Then we just need to choose which of these tool paths we need.
15 minutes of some fairly easy cam work later, we have our parts all cammed out. We have the program form. The program is definitely not super optimized. There's some like wasted tool changes and like this probably doesn't need to take 15 minutes to surface or to face off these parts. Though a lot of times my fusion estimates are longer than it is in reality. Um, but that does also include our inspection plan. So now when I'm inspecting these parts, I can just hit record manual inspection and type in all the different values. And this will generate a inspection report that I can ship to my customer. So how do we hold this stuff in the mill? My answer is still super glue. Super glue is still the key for these small thin parts, but I've kind of changed up my process a little bit. Normally for metal parts, I use this specific super glue, Loctite 480, and I go directly from the metal fixture to the metal part. But in this case, we can't do that because acetone, which is the solvent for super glue, will make your parts look ugly. So you have to find some way of not getting any super glue onto your parts. I would definitely recommend going and checking out my super glue and tape video first if you haven't watched that yet. The technique we're going to cover is basically just a modification of that technique. A lot of the fundamental foundational knowledge will be in that video where I can be a little bit more thorough and just the differences will be in this video. So earlier we covered cast first extruded acrylic, but the other thing you have to think about is the thickness. And it is kind of tempting to always buy three millimeter because that stuff generally is like the cheapest and it's pretty plentifully available. However, if you can buy thinner stuff and fit your part in it, do it. The thinnest stuff that you can get and still fit your part in, that is the, the ideal way. And the reason is because then you're removing less material off the top of your part. The, the way we're about to do this, you'll see we're only going to remove material from one side, and that is a perfect recipe for warping. So if you can get away with removing 10 thou off the top of your part instead of 100 thou, it'll make a big difference in how well your part's going to come off on the first try. That being said, with cast acrylic, I have not really had any internal stresses issues. That is more of a extruded acrylic kind of problem. If you're working with thin acrylic, there's a couple different ways that you can cut it. The way with the lowest barrier to entry is just to take a razor knife and score it a couple times. I'll use a parallel as a guide here. Score it a couple times and then snap it off. It doesn't always break right on the first try, but considering there's no equipment involved in this, it's relatively reliable. And now we should be able to just take it to the corner of my workbench and snap it off. So there we go. Nice clean cut, no extra equipment required. My least favorite way to cut acrylic is on my table saw. It definitely works, but acrylic can be kind of chippy and it'll spit little pieces out at you. It works a lot better on polycarbonate if you're doing polycarbonate. Um, you can do this, but I would not recommend it if you can avoid it. If you happen to have a woodworking bandsaw or a small vertical bandsaw, kind of like this combination uh, porta band unit, that also works really well. The finer tooth blade, the better. And then lastly, there's how I cut my materials. This is the fastest, the easiest, the most precise, and gives you the best cut quality, the least likely to, to leave a burr or to crack the material. It's also the most expensive by far, and that is a CO2 laser. I happen to have this 100 watt Chinese unit, and this thing is fantastic for preparing acrylic or polycarbonate materials for the mill, especially because you can load up a whole sheet of them and cut them all at the same time. I would of course never recommend that you buy a laser just to laser cut your stock, but oh man, is it nice if you can do it. So in my laser software, I just drew a little square and now all we have to do is hit start and you'll see how fast here this will cut our material. Well, okay, maybe you won't see. And there we go. We have a nice, beautiful, perfectly cut piece of material. As a bonus, because it's cut with heat, it's basically pre de -burred. So it's ready to go on the mill right away. If you cut it with a method that does leave a burr, I found that just one of these standard normal deburring tools with a nice sharp blade does a pretty good job on acrylic. This was not a sharp blade. Let's try that again with a sharp blade. One of these tools does a really nice job on acrylic. And one of the repeat themes we're gonna see here is sharp tools make a big difference. 
That also goes for the tools that you're gonna be using to mill your part. A brand new tool will cut a lot better than a old worn out one. In terms of tooling for cutting acrylic and polycarbonate, or any plastic really for that matter, I don't think you need to buy plastic specific tools. They do exist and I'm sure they have their time and a place. Most of the time I go into my drawer and I grab a tool that is designed for aluminum that's brand new and has never been used before and use that in plastic. The plastic will basically never dull your tool unless you're cutting a material that has some sort of inclusion like a, a fiberglass filled or a carbon fiber filled plastic. So you can basically just put them back in your drawer with them being brand new for when you go back to doing aluminum or some other metal. So this next step may seem a little bit weird because this has a nice layer of plastic on there, but I am going to take off this layer and then replace it with tape. And there's a good reason for that. And the reason is a lot of trial and error. So we still need something to protect the plastic from the glue we're about to put down. However, I have learned that this stuff is very gummy and it gets tangled up inside the, the end mill when you cut all the way through. And it just causes a lot of process reliability issues and just problems in general. This tape is a little bit harder, I guess, or more brittle or something. And it'll machine much more like the acrylic where it'll come off in chips instead of wrapping around the tool and scrapping your part. Fortunately, because this was protected by this, I don't need to do any cleaning or scuffing up or anything on the surface. I'm just gonna go straight tape to acrylic. The one thing is you wanna be really careful not to leave any gaps because any gaps glue will get through and then you'll have to find some way to get it off your part, which may just be impossible because you can't use acetone. I now wanna scuff up this tape a little bit and for that, I've started using this 400 grit sandpaper. Scotch-Brite works perfectly well, but I think the sandpaper just works a little bit faster. And I have a few bubbles I need to get out here. Let's grab my rolling pin. See if I can roll any of these out. Okay, and now notice I've left the tape a little bit long on either end. That's so it doesn't move as I'm doing things like burnishing or sanding them. But now that the tape is all applied, I can just cut that off. And if there's any overhang on one of the sides, use my scalpel here and just kind of give it a quick trim. You could use a razor blade or whatever. I, I like these scalpels because the blades are so cheap and quick to change out. There we go. So now this is ready to go on the mill. If you are using regular super glue, I would put down a layer of tape on the aluminum fixture. If you are using the Loctite 480 black stuff, which I am unfortunately out of at the moment, but if you have that stuff, you can go straight to the aluminum fixture. So at this point, everything has been cleaned, everything has been prepped, and I have the tape on one side of this and the original plastic is still on the top. So I'm just gonna add glue. So now I can just plop it down. Uh, I'm gonna give it some little wiggles since that was so poorly distributed. And thankfully, because it's clear, you can actually see, um, I made a mark here on where my center point was. And then additionally, I can see how well the glue is spread out. So let's get that put in there, aligned to the best of our ability and stick something heavy on it. I've started using this big block of HDPE as the first layer because it, one is less likely to scratch something like the acrylic compared to this big sheet of, um, of A36 steel, but also glue doesn't stick to it very well. So it just kind of prevents some possible problems down the road. All right, this should be good. Hopefully nothing's glued. Yep, the block isn't. So now that this is glued down, I'm going to remove this top protective plastic. And again, the reason I am doing this is because this is like a rather stretchy, tough material, and this will wrap itself around an end mill, become a solid blob, and then do all kinds of chaos and mayhem to your part. So you don't want that on there. At this point, the only thing left is to actually run the parts. So I suppose, I suppose let's do that.
And here we have our finished parts. They seem to have come out okay. I don't see any features missing. Finishes look fine. Now we need to get them off of the plate. Now, normally I don't do it on a fixture that's this big. I just use a teeny tiny little thing in a vise and it's easy to heat up the back of that. Now this is a like a three in one painter's tool that I've had for a while. Whenever I use it for what I'm about to do, I take it to the Scotch-Brite wheel and I make sure there is nothing sharp on here. So it is nice and smooth and there's no burrs. There's nothing that's gonna grab or scratch our part. Um, I even will put it on the polish wheel to just confirm that it's super smooth. And because we have two layers of material underneath here, we can just kind of use this to pry it right up. Ideally getting underneath the tape. And then from here we can take off the protective layers. It's a little bit hard to see, but this is our finished part. It's not optically clear, but it's definitely acceptably clear for any application that isn't optics. Um, we can look at it under the microscope to get a little bit better idea of the finishes. And again, it's just kind of hard to see, but it, it looks pretty darn good. Um, all of our dr holes are look fine. Our deburring looks eh, good enough. I would call this a win. But there's one more thing that I forgot to mention, and that is crazing. Crazing is chemical damage that is caused to acrylic, and it looks like this. Insert stock photo here. To my understanding, there's a couple different ways that you can cause this. One is thermal stresses. So that's why I run with coolant and try to keep everything cool. I use a lower surface speed and a higher feed per tooth because that'll keep the, the cut cooler. Uh, which will help prevent some like of those weird stress effects. The other thing that'll cause it is chemicals. And I should have mentioned this when I was talking about cleaning, but specifically alcohol, like these alcohol wipes, that will destroy your part. And the worst part about it is it might not be a fast process. So you might ship a perfectly good part and then it arrives to your customer and it's all just cracked and crumbled to pieces. So. Be very, very careful about what solvents that you use on this. No degreaser, no Windex, no alcohol, no acetone, pretty much nothing except soapy water. Additionally, pay attention to what coolant you're running in your machine. Uh, full synthetics can cause damage to these. This is Qualicam 251, and to my understanding, it is completely compatible. I've never had any issues in the long term. I've never had any complaints from customers, and the machine has acrylic windows, so it seems like it's fine. But be careful if you're running some sort of full synthetic um, and especially pay attention if you have one of the kind of more aggressive mist lubrication systems. Some of those have some nastier chemicals, some nastier coolants in the, the MQL mist. So I hope you guys found that helpful. If you want to support me, you can become a channel member and get early access to my videos. And I'll be adding some more perks as we go to that channel membership thing. But right now, a buck a month gets you early access to all my videos. Thank you for watching and I will see you later.